to introduce uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Kuwaiti. Dr. Al Kuwaiti is a consultant neurologist in Tawam Hospital. He has more than 13 years' experience in the field of neurology and vascular neurology. He's completed his residency program from McGill University in Montreal and followed by vascular neurology fellowship from the famous University of Minnesota. Uh, it is a honor and pleasure to introduce Mohammed Al Kuwaiti who will talk us uh, in secondary prevention and stroke. Thank you, Dr. Kuwaiti. Okay, uh, again, my name is uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Kuwaiti. I'm a neurologist at Tawam Hospital. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me uh, for uh, this session. I'll be presenting on cryptogenic stroke, uh, the term ESIS and, and secondary stroke prevention. Okay, I have no disclosures for, the, for this session. Uh, my objective is I'll be defining cryptogenic stroke and the term ESIS, approach to the diagnosis and the underlying cause of cryptogenic stroke and the potential role of atrial fibrillation, atrial cardiopathy and PFO. And finally, I'll speak about PFO closure and new guideline uh, regarding this. So um, the definition, so cryptogenic stroke is an umbrella term. It's a stroke of unknown cause. However, it takes uh, uh, much more, uh, it takes lacunar stroke and non lacunar stroke uh, and cases who are not completely uh, worked up. So the term ESIS uh, was, was coined uh, around six years ago to specifically define uh, embolic stroke uh, of undetermined source, a clot that traveled and patient had a comprehensive workup. This term was coined by uh, Dr. Uh, Hart uh, around seven years ago. And um, it includes 20, around 25% of stroke cases are actually cryptogenic, and around half of these are ESIS. If you look at the burden and features of uh, ESIS patients, this is a pooled analysis of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, cryptogenic stroke cases or ESIS patients. And uh, uh, actually, these patients have a, usually have a smaller stroke, an age of five a median an age of five. Uh, their age is around 65. Uh, this study says 65 is actually a younger age. However, this is a Western study. So you have to take this age uh, carefully. And uh, usually these cases have less uh, risk factors. And the stroke, uh, an annualized stroke risk in these cases around 4.5%, which is not that high. And uh, looking at the, the workup that we do for uh, uh, stroke patients. I found this uh, great uh, uh, article at the New England Journal of Medicine by Professor Saver, uh, where he uh, uh, defines the standard evalu evaluation of stroke patients. So as you all know, the standard evaluation is, uh, so after history and physical, we do the regular blood workup, cardiac ECG, 24 hour uh, halter monitor, cardiac imaging, looking at vessels in the, in the head and the neck. Um, these are the basic things that we do. However, if these wor this workup is actually negative and they, it cannot explain the etiology of the stroke, you can, you can move up for the, further to an advanced evaluation where you can, you can uh, ask for a hypercoagulable workup. You can ask for a prolonged cardiac monitor for up to a month uh, as a non-invasive uh, uh, recorder. And also you can, uh, try looking for signs or uh, of, of uh, vasculitis or um, uh, looking for, uh, trying to do a transcranial and double to see if there's any uh, monitoring of, you can do monitoring of emboli or emboli detection. However, if still you couldn't find the cause of the stroke, there's other things you can do. Uh, for example, you can look for uh, occult cancer. You can further look into a prolonged cardiac monitor with a loop recorder that goes up for three years and uh, uh, you can look at the structure of the heart by doing an MRI or a CT and uh, uh, trying to get probably, uh, some patients will require CSF analysis, probably a, a, some patient will require brain biopsy, vasculitis, for example, is, is, a, is a, uh, there's suspicion of, of vasculitis. And then there's genetic testing. Uh, and some PFO cases you can also do uh, Dopplers of the lower limbs and upper limbs. And uh, you can also look at, can do MR venous of the pelvis. So in terms of uh, 
thesis cases, uh, the management recommendation right now is usually aggressive medical therapy and antiplatelet. There's no enough evidence that anticoagulation uh, is beneficial. Uh, there was a recent uh, randomized controlled trials uh, done um, uh, navigate ESIS and uh, respect ESIS. So navigate looked into a reverxaban um, comparing it to aspirin in uh, patients who have ESIS. And this study was stopped early on because of no benefit and there's a higher chance of bleeding in patients on, on reverxaban. And Debigatran also did not show uh, a benefit over the aspirin on the, in the RESPECT ESIS trial. Uh, however, looking at the sub-analysis of uh, these trials, you'll see that uh, they, uh, the etiologies, they included patients with ESIS. However, uh, uh, the patients were looking at sub-analysis uh, of different etiologies. In these cases, uh, so there were some etiologies that favored anticoagulation, for example, uh, left atrial enlargement, for example, or left ventricular disease. And uh, usually patients who have atherosclerosis uh, favors more aspirin. Uh, I include this diagram because ESIS uh, is, is again another umbrella term. There's a lot of uh, different etiology that can lead to ESIS. However, we have to try to define the etiology to be able to uh, coin the best therapy. So. Uh, as, as you can see here, there's uh, examples are like atrial cardiopathy, which is, which is a new risk factor was for risk factor people are looking into, looking into and uh, uh, prolonged cardiac monitor to look for a further uh, like a risk of AFib or looking at the uh, PFO status, uh, looking at the, uh, the, uh, the aortic arch uh, or cancer. So in this slide, I have uh, different types of cardiac monitoring to detect AFib. And if you see, it starts with the simplest one, which is the ECG. And you see the percentage of detecting AFib with a simple ECG is up, up to 2.7%. However, in a, in a stroke unit where you can do a telemetry, the risk, the, the percentage of detecting AFib goes up higher to up to uh, around threefold to up to 7.6%. There was a study, uh, Embrace study, a Canadian study, uh, 16 centers where they compared Holter monitor for 24 hours and um, a mobile uh, cardiac monitor, uh, like a patch, uh, non-invasive one for 30 days. And uh, there was significant difference in, in detection of AFib. Uh, so it was about up to 16% if you monitor for 30 days compared to around uh, less than 5% if you monitor for 24 hours. So it's, a, it's a significant difference. And there was a crystal AF trial looking at uh, cardiac loop recorders uh, where the uh, AFib detection was up to 30% if you monitor for uh, up to uh, uh, three years. These are diagrams, these are pictures of uh, these recorders. So this is a, the regular halter monitor. Uh, this is the non-invasive patch that can go up for, for a, a month. And this is the loop recorder that goes subcutaneously. And I'm just trying to show here that uh, patients who have a, a, a higher CHAD score and patients who are older than 70, their risk of detecting if, uh, AFib is uh, much higher the more you monitor these cases. Uh, coming to atrial uh, cardiopathy. So uh, the, size of the, uh, the size of the left atrium matters. So uh, in this, uh, this graph, it shows here patients who have moderate to severe left atrial enlargement, they are, have a higher chance of developing uh, cryptogenic stroke, cardioembolic stroke. And uh, there was there's a recent uh, study that is still ongoing called Arcadia, and it's comparing apixaban versus aspirin uh, in patients who have uh, atrial cardiopathy and is defined in this study by doing three different, uh, uh, three different tests uh, by, doing an, by using an echo, using the serum anti-pro BMP and looking at the ECG, trying to, to measure the PTFV1. Hopefully in a few years, we'll have more answers. And uh, uh, PL4 is a, is a common uh, risk factor. It's actually a common uh, 
uh, finding in, in the community. So up to 25% of the community will have a PFO. However, uh, PFO prevalence in patients who have uh, 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 ESIS is much higher. It's going to go up to 45 or even 50% in some cases. And it's always, it's actually a tug of war between car interventional cardiologists and stroke neurologists in the past. What should we do with the PFO? So um, I hope this time we have better, we have more answers now. So uh, this is a, an, a transogeal echo with and without Velselva showing the uh, micro, the, ambul the bubbles crossing into the other side from the right to left. So a PFO closure is uh, done uh, through a, a catheter uh, and it goes all the way up to the left atrium and uh, they de deploy the, an umbrella-like structure that comes back and then sandwiches the, the left, uh, the septum, the PFO. Looks like a simple procedure. Uh, there was three major trials in 2012 and 13 that were actually negative. They didn't show any benefit uh, in um, PFO closure versus uh, medical therapy. And the uh, American Stroke Guideline actually in that 2014, a year later, uh, uh, came up saying that patients with cryptogenic stroke or TIA and PFO without evidence of DVT, the available data do not support the benefit for PFO closure. However, if, if you they only support PFO closure in patients who have risks of recurrent DVT or patients who have DVT uh, and, and, and increased risk of another one. Uh, later in 2017, there were three randomized controlled trials that were published. They were actually positive trials uh, in PFO closure. And um, I won't go into detail, but these are the, the names of the trials and the patient uh, uh, number. And these are randomized prospective uh, control trials where they were open label. And uh, looking at the data of these trials, uh, so if you look at uh, trials here are on the left side and uh, looking at the device closure versus the medical therapy, uh, there was much less stroke in patients um, on, on the what closure of the PFO compared to medical therapy, the absolute risk uh, for recurrent stroke reduction for recurrent stroke was up was 3.3%. And this is a, a table where actually I, I borrowed from a, my colleague. Uh, it's an, an interesting table. You see up the first three rows are the negative trials um, and the sec second three rows are the positive trials. I'm trying to feel, see the difference in these trials in, the, in, in patient enrollment. You'll see patient, uh, you'll see that Positive trials, they include a patient who had ESIS, uh, the ESIS embolic stroke on the terminal source and had a complete workup. And they also looked at the same time, they looked at the anatomical variant of the PFO, uh, looking at the, the shunt and looking at the atrial septal aneurysm. So uh, as you know, there's always complications with procedures. So, uh, and this procedure specifically, their complications are AFib, uh, and it's, it's up to 4.6% uh, risk of AFib. And in many of these cases, AFib was actually a transient uh, phenomenon. Uh, there is, and this, the, the CLOSE trial published this and they had only one case of uh, uh, atrial flutter and uh, two of supraventricular tachycardia, air embolism. And uh, this is a stroke, uh, 2021 stroke guideline um, so for ESIS, they include this table here uh, saying uh, there's no benefit for, to anticoagulate uh, ESIS patients. It's not recommended to anticoagulate, to, to anticoagulate patients who have ESIS. Um, and there's no benefit uh, on using ticagrelor. This is specifically defined in the, in the new guideline. And looking at the stroke prevention recommendations in terms of PFO, there are um, a new recommendations uh, a few months, few weeks ago. And the first recommendation here is saying that um, it's uh, the PFO closure uh, have to be done in a jointly fashion with cardiology and trying to take into account the pro probability of a causal role for PFO. And uh, 
uh, the, and they define patients should be between 18 to 60 years of age with non-lacunar ischemic stroke of undetermined cause despite thorough evaluation and a, and a PFO with a high risk and not typical features. Um, and it's reasonable, so it's reasonable to close uh, this PFO with a trans catheter device. Um, and uh, they actually include this flow chart in the guideline, which I find uh, interesting and useful. So uh, a young patient between 18 and 60 years of age presenting with a, uh, an embolic stroke and PFO. So the first thing you need to do is you have to do a complete evaluation. So the evaluation is suggested here, including uh, Dopplers of the upper and lower limbs and and uh, pelvic MRVs and there's many and we already discussed this early on earlier on and um, and if if there was no etiology defined then you move on forward to a potential paradoxical embolism so uh, then you have to evaluate that the patient have an atrial septal aneurysm or a large right to left shunt so this is the anatomical uh, high risk um, feature that they that the patients have to have uh, to be able to say that he has a high risk PFO. And th in such case, high risk PFO, PFO closure is reasonable. However, there is still factors uh, uh, that you might want to take into consideration, like looking at the rope score uh, or uh, looking at if the patient requires anticoagulation. Um, and even the patient, if the patient have a PFO but doesn't have the high risk features, um, uh, you can still try to, uh, PFO closure is not well established. The benefit of it is not well established. However, you can always look at the risk by looking at the rope score, um, history of DVT, recurrent stroke. Um, so in conclusion, I'd like to say cryptogenic stroke is a very common diagnosis after a stroke, complete workup is necessary. And therapy is currently with antiplatelet unless specific etiology was identified. Prolonged cardiac monitoring, monitoring increased rates of detecting atrial fibrillation and atrial cardiopathy as a potential risk uh, factor for ESIS. Um, and PFO closure is reasonable in the age of between 18 to 60 years old with patients who have ESIS, PFO with a high risk anatomical features, and, and trying to develop a, 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 like a causal association and join, jointly with cardiology. Um, I thank you, and at the end, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to, to invite everybody to Abu Dhabi Brain Conference, which will take place in, uh, online uh, from the 2nd to the 4th of September of this year. Thank you. <laughs>